mastitis affects approximately 2 to 10 percent of postpartum American women. Even though this equates to as many as 50,000 to 400,000 women annually, it is known to be an underreported medical condition. When a woman decides to breastfeed her baby, she's making a significant commitment that involves decisions about herself, her baby, and her family. For most postpartum women, breastfeeding is an important milestone in their lives. It promotes mother-infant bonding and offers numerous health benefits for both the mother and the infant. A common and often underdiagnosed complication is mastitis. The benefits of breastfeeding for mothers include a faster and easier postpartum recovery, a decreased risk of osteoporosis, protection against ovarian cancer, and a reduction in the risk of breast cancer. Breastfeeding also decreases cardiac risks and type 2 diabetes. In the first few days of nursing, breast milk is preceded by colostrum, which transfers immunities naturally to the infant. This unique composition of breast milk is designed for each individual child, helping to protect the gastrointestinal and respiratory tracts from pathogens, aiding in digestion, and allowing for optimal physical and mental development. From a psychological and social point of view, breastfed babies are more developmentally mature and secure in their environment, with reported higher cognitive developmental values. But mastitis is a real thing, and I think it's really hard for some people to understand what degree that it can interfere with breastfeeding. Nurses and healthcare providers should be concerned with interruptions in breastfeeding that can disrupt breast milk expression, as this can affect breast milk production. Interruptions could be caused by engorgement, plugged ducts, mastitis, and more seriously, a breast abscess. In addition, a history of breast surgery, chest surgery, or any injury to the chest wall can cause engorgement or plug ducts due to scar tissue. Any of these conditions can be detrimental to the mother and the baby's overall health and well-being. Recent research on the anatomy of the lactating breast supports the need to define mastitis and describe its characteristics, classify the two types of mastitis, adenitis and cellulitis, as well as identify the signs and symptoms of both. Discuss the causes and contributing factors that lead to acute mastitis in lactating women. And identify causative agents and pathogens associated with infectious mastitis and the method of entry. And finally, we will discuss evidence-based interventions for mastitis as well as prevention techniques. Mastitis is an infection of the breast connective tissue during the second phase of lactogenesis or milk production in lactating women. It is important to differentiate between the various complications that can occur in the new mother. Engorgement. For some mothers, when her milk is coming in, her breasts become extremely swollen with generalized warmth. The mother's temperature may reach 38.4 degrees Celsius, but generally she does not feel ill. This is the beginning of milk stasis, which can occur as a result of failure to change infant position to allow the emptying of all lobes of the breast, failure to alternate breasts at feedings, poor latch, or poor letdown due to maternal nipple pain or improper pumping. I could say as of probably two days ago, I don't feel the need to cry during breastfeeding anymore, so that is joyous. Um, because <laughs> it was painful. It was very painful. I was very frustrated and um, been doing quite a bit of pumping and um, having to give him bottles just out of necessity just because it just caused so much pain. I really should have taken a breastfeeding class ahead of time, but I had no idea that you needed to do that kind of thing. I took for granted that breastfeeding is just a natural process and that you might actually need, you know, to know all the tips other than just what I've been reading in all of the books. So um, just to have that hands-on 
tutorial from somebody who knows what they're doing is um, invaluable and uh, didn't know that ahead of time and really wished I would have. But Mastitis can be classified into two primary types, adenitis and cellulitis. The onset of adenitis is gradual, generally after a feeding. It occurs in one breast and swelling or localized heat may be intermittent. Pain in the breast is localized to one area, and even with an elevated temperature, the mother does not feel ill. Clinical signs and symptoms are less severe. Breast ducts are presumably blocked, resulting in milk stasis. Treatment measures do need to be initiated to prevent progression to cellulitis. The more severe form of mastitis is cellulitis, which is where the interlobular connective tissue has been infected. Symptoms may come on suddenly after about 10 days postpartum. One breast may have a pink, tender, hot swollen wedge-shaped area, a fever of 38.5 Celsius, more greater, with chills and systemic flu-like aches may be one of the last symptoms. If untreated, abscesses or septicemia may occur. And so she sent me down to the um, breast specialist, um, drain it, and it was very disgusting. And it ha was two Dixie cups just filled of um, staph infection, and they tested it, and everything was okay. And so I had to go in um, four times and have a needle stuck into my breast and had it drained. And it hurt really bad, and, but I just kept nursing in on that side. And eventually it did get all, go away. A breast abscess is more likely to occur with a history of mastitis or a history of breast injury. This may be related to the inflammatory process which results in remodeling of tissue. A breast abscess presents similarly to mastitis except that there is a firm area in the breast, often with a fluctuants, which is an indication of the presence of pus in a bacterial infection. An abscess can be confirmed with an ultrasound. Abscesses are treated with surgical drainage or needle aspiration, which may need to be repeated. Fluid from the abscess is cultured and antibiotics administered. More and more hospitals have realized the benefits of having lactation specialists. Yet new mothers may still have limited access to a lactation specialist, which can lead to a lack of awareness of personal hygiene and skin protective techniques a lack of awareness of signs and symptoms of mastitis, and often improper self-medication. I think on day three, one of the nurses um, tried to help, but by that point I was just in so much pain that nothing felt okay. So I think it was about a week later, maybe a little over a week later, um, I got help from a lactation consultant and um, used the breast shield, and that helped a lot. The infection usually begins when bacteria enter the breast tissue as a result of some type of trauma. Sore or cracked nipples may be one type of trauma. As a result of nipple trauma, feedings may be altered, reduced, or discontinued. There are certain factors that contribute to bacterial access. Breast and nipple trauma are first and foremost. Poor hand washing techniques prior to breastfeeding. Improper breast hygiene or improper cleaning of breast pump equipment or other contributing factors. Bacteria growth can result from nipple trauma and exposure to bacteria. Things that can amplify bacterial growth are plastic lined breast pads and the abundant use of occlusive ointments. Obstruction of ductal tissue may occur when restrictive clothing or improperly fitted bras are worn. Anything that presses on the breast can cause obstruction. Even sleeping on the stomach when breasts are filling with milk may create obstruction. Additional risk factors for mastitis include tongue-mouth position, ankyloglossia, having an infant with a cleft lip or palate, or a short frenulum. Beckham is slightly tongue-tied, and so his tongue did not come out appropriately to latch um, properly. And so I had basically what um, would have happened had he had teeth. I had open sores um, on my nipples and open wounds, um, which caused them to believe that's probably where the infection started. And for the mother, 
nipple piercings, and yeast infections. Before we describe the actual process of infection, let's review the important hormonal processes and anatomy of the breast. In the new mother, milk production begins with a drop in estrogen and progesterone. At the start of a feed when the baby suckles quickly, the physiologic mechanism is to stimulate the letdown reflex in the mother. Oxytocin released from the posterior pituitary causes myoepithelial cells to contract, leading to milk ejection. Recent studies find that each breast contains 4 to 18 milk ducts arranged in a complex network converging at the nipple. In each breast, there are 4 to 18 lobules containing 10 to 100 alveoli. The alveolus is the site of milk synthesis. Secretion consists of clusters of epithelial secretory cells or lactocytes. Lactocytes are surrounded by myoepithelial cells to form smooth muscle contractile units, which are responsible for ejecting milk into the ducts from the lumen of the alveoli. Ducts are capable of increasing in diameter temporarily to accommodate the increase in milk volume at milk ejection. When milk is not removed from the breast within about two minutes, the diameter of the ducts return to a resting state due to the backward flow of milk. Inflammation may occur as macrophages circulate in the bloodstream and bind to wounded blood vessels moving to the site of infection or injury. These macrophages release multiple inflammatory mediators such as cytokines. As the inflammation progresses, white blood cells engulf foreign cells. Phagosomes and lysosomes break down microbes, producing free radicals. This further inflames the tissues, resulting in damage. Any one of these three mechanisms, milk stasis, breach of skin integrity, or severe inflammation, provides the perfect setting for mastitis. The most common portal of entry of the pathogens causing mastitis is either through a nipple fissure or by way of the lactiferous ducts to a secreting lobule, to periductal lymphatics or by way of hematogenous spread. So with any one of the mechanisms that have been described, even normal bacterial flora can find the ideal setting for growth. Some of the more common organisms attributed to mastitis are Staphylococcus aureus, with more recent evidence of MRSA, Staphylococcus epidermidis, E. coli, A. beta hemolytic streptococcus, and Candida albicans. Staphylococcus aureus is the most common infectious organism. Staph aureus is frequently found in the nose and skin in about 33% of the population and causes disease through tissue invasion and toxin production. Staph infections are known to cause abscesses, which consist of a fibrin wall surrounded by inflamed tissue, enclosing a central core of pus containing organisms and leukocytes. From this focus of infection, the organisms may be disseminated hematogenously. Cases of methicillin-resistant Staph aureus have been widely reported, more often presenting as repetitive or antibiotic-resistant mastitis. Staphylococcus epidermidis is similar in cluster shape to Staph aureus. It is also an inhabitant of the skin. This organism produces a slime resulting in biofilm formation. It is the ability to form a biofilm that makes this bacteria particularly virulent. E. coli are a large and diverse group of bacteria. Although most strains are harmless, others can cause severe infection. Group A streptococcus and streptococcus pneumonia strains are often found in the throat and on the skin with most people having no symptoms of illness. Infection can occur when these bacteria get into parts of the body where they are not normally found. Candida albicans has been identified in women who report a syndrome of deep pain in the breast during and immediately after lactation. Candida infections may result from antibiotics used in the treatment of bacterial infections for mastitis. Candida infections are basically topical, but have such a highly inflammatory process that they irritate the 10th intercostal nerve. The resulting pain syndrome greatly impacts milk ejection. 
An antibiotic that can be tolerated by the infant as well as the mother is generally prescribed. I had all these antibiotics going through me and I was thoroughly convinced that I wouldn't be able to and she said, no, please, please, please keep nursing your baby and I thought, my gosh, <laughs> you know, if she's the expert and she says that's what I should do, then, and he, he loved it, so yes. it broke my heart to have to say no, and <laughs> so we just kept doing it because he loved it and she said that was the best thing, so. The mother should continue to nurse on both breasts, especially the affected side. Rest is imperative for good recovery. Mothers may be advised to apply warm packs prior to feeding or pumping, then ice packs afterwards for comfort. Nurses should advise the mother to drink plenty of fluids. She may take an analgesic, such as acetaminophen or ibuprofen. The mother should wear a well-fitting, comfortable bra that does not cause painful pressure. Maybe a little over a week later, um, I got help from a lactation consultant and um, used the breast shield, and that helped a lot. It did slow down my production quite a bit, so I could see why you're only supposed to use them for, I think, a week. Um, so uh, I used that for maybe four days and um, at least felt healed enough to, you know, to, to not use it anymore. So that was um, really important. Some women may present with pain and a breast mass as the main symptoms of mastitis rather than fever. I think it's interesting that none of us had temperatures and I don't know what you guys ended up saying but I told them that um, I had my appendix out and two hours before I was rushed in for emergency surgery before it ruptured I still didn't have a temperature so I said to the doctor I don't get temperatures if you think it looks like mastitis and the only reason you say it's not is the temperature then I want whatever you give people who have mastitis persistently painful breasts and non-healing nipples should be directly examined by a primary health care provider making sure though that they recognize that they are sick that's the hardest part is to get women who are breastfeeding babies and have other babies are working that they're sick. A lactation specialist can ensure that preventative steps are taken by educating mothers to use meticulous hand washing techniques, identify early warning signs of breast and feeding problems, plan for separation, for example returning to work, achieve latch techniques that are specific to each mother and infant, and educate the mother regarding proper pumping techniques. Too few feedings can result in milk stasis, and too many feedings in the early days of nursing can result in nipple trauma. Women who feed 8 to 12 times per day are less likely to develop mastitis. When anticipating a return to work, the breastfeeding mother may want to obtain a quality breast pump establish a pumping schedule, and store extra breast milk for the baby. This will also reduce the possibility of engorgement. By understanding the contributing factors that are associated with breast infections, nurses are in key positions to either prevent its occurrence or to help mothers live through mastitis.